Washington Journal continues. And we are back with Jeff Weaver, the uh, former campaign manager for Bernie Sanders in 2016, author of the book, How Bernie Won, Inside the Revolution, that's talk, taking back our country and where we go from here to here today to talk about the future of the Democratic Party. Thank you for being here. Oh, my pleasure, really. The Democratic National Committee met last weekend uh, to talk about the way forward for nominating the next presidential candidate of the party. You're a member of the Unity Reform Commission. Tell our viewers what that commission is and what was decided. Sure, so at the end of the last primary process, uh, uh, I and uh, my counterpart on the Clinton campaign uh, negotiated a process uh, to move forward to address uh, some of the problems that I think everybody observed happened in the last uh, nominating process in the 2015-2016 uh, time frame. That uh, included the creation of a commission uh, that would take a look at these issues and uh, that commission met for over a year. Uh, it had representatives appointed by Senator Sanders, uh, representatives appointed by Secretary Clinton and uh, representatives from the DNC. Uh, and we addressed a number of issues. The issue of superdelegates is the one that's gotten most attention, but uh, there are also reforms in the areas of caucuses and opening up the process uh, and transparency at the DNC itself. We had a report uh, at the end of the day which was unanimously supported by the people on the commission, uh, and then it went to, into the Democratic Party's more formal uh, process. Uh, they have a rules and bylaws a, a committee uh, which reviewed the uh, recommendations we had made. Uh, they added some, they changed some, uh, and then that is what was voted on uh, at the uh, DNC meeting this past weekend. So what will be different in 2020? Well, there are a few things will be different. Again, superdelegates was the most high-profile thing. Uh, folks will remember that, uh, unlike the Republicans, the Democratic process uh, gave votes at the convention to a pool of a little over 700 uh, elected officials and party insiders. And the cumulative uh, number of those uh, superdelegates uh, was equivalent to the elected delegates from some 25 states in the District of Columbia combined. So it was a big pool. It was about 15 percent of the pool of, of delegates. Uh, and they were unpledged. They could support it whoever they uh, wanted. Uh, and folks will remember that Secretary Clinton, uh, you know, uh, started her campaign much earlier than Bernie Sanders did, obviously had more support from the establishment of the party. Uh, there came a point at which she had, you know, three or four hundred of these superdelegates locked up before a single voter had cast a vote. Uh, and the folks felt that that was uh, uh, warped the process because then voters say, well, well, my goodness, one candidate has such an advantage, why do I even want to participate? Uh, and, it, and, it, and it created uh, an air of a quote-unquote rigged system, right? That's the word people use on social media. Um, and so what they have done is uh, now going forward, uh, these superdelegates will not vote on the first ballot, and the Democratic Party has not had a second ballot since uh, the 50s. Uh, they will not vote on the first ballot, uh, and a candidate can go in with a majority of pledged delegates, these are delegates elected by the people, uh, and, and win the nomination. So that's a major change forward. Uh, we've changed the way caucuses are run to make sure that uh, they're much more transparent, that they're accessible, that they have absentee voting, uh, and then we're not closing people out of that process. Uh, there was also a, a language that unfortunately was not as strong as some of us wanted about opening up primaries in a number of states where uh, young people are being locked out of the democratic primary process and uh, disproportionately people of color. So uh, we've got to make changes in those uh, uh, areas still. There's always always more reforms to be made, uh, but this was a tremendous leap forward and I, I you know, I want to uh, congratulate everybody who was involved with it and I, a special word out to uh, Tom Perez, the chair of the party. Uh, who embraced these reforms, who fought for these reforms, uh, and they passed at the DNC by a vote of three to one, something that I thought a lot of, I think a lot of reform-minded people would have thought impossible previously. But Well, I want our viewers to listen to and have you respond to the former DNC chair, Don Fowler, sure. because he raised concerns Saturday about the voices that Democrats would lose under this DNC superdelegate rule change. Here he is. Sure. First, it's disenfranchising. 200 African Americans will be eliminated from the vote on the first ballot. 100 Latinos, dozens of people from the LGB community, and dozens of people who suffer physical or other disabilities. Those will all be eliminated because they are contained in these people, you and me, and the elected officials across America, those will be eliminated on the first ballot. The Democratic Party has been the engine for conveying the vote 
to African Americans, to women, to LGBTQ people, and all other Americans. We have been the engine, the engine to spread democracy. Now we're going to turn around and take democracy away from these folks. It's not right, and it's not fitting for the Democratic Party to do that. And there has been opposition as well from the Black Caucus on Capitol Hill. The Black Caucus chair opposes DNC plan to weaken super and delegate influence. Right. Well, I, look, uh, you know, and I respect both Cedric Richmond, who's the chair of the CBC, and, and Chairman Fowler. Uh, but in this case, they're just wrong. Uh, you know, the Democratic Party process has affirmative action targets for every category of delegates. So when you run for president of the United States in the Democratic Party, uh, and your delegates are selected in, at the, at the uh, congressional district level, there's then a pool of delegates you have to make sure that your pool of delegates is appropriately reflective uh, of the uh, rank and file of the Democratic Party in terms of race, in terms of gender, uh, in terms of sexual orientation, and a number of other categories. The one category of delegates where that is not a requirement are the elected officials, the members of Congress who are, are super delegates, the members of the U.S. Senate, the governors, you get what you get. Um, and that pool of voters in, in this context is whiter, more male, more straight. Uh, and so, in fact, by eliminating the vote of superdelegates on the first round, you are creating a pool of uh, delegates who are voting which is most reflective of our base, which is most diverse, which is guaranteed to be half women. Uh, and that's just not true over on Capitol Hill, as you, as you well know. Yeah. Well, y even with this change, how does, or, or what hurdles do you have to overcome to um, get over what you wrote about in the book, which is the media? And you wrote one issue that weighed on voters' minds was Bernie's electability. It is a sad irony, given that outcome in, in November 2016, that a year earlier we were spending time and resources trying to figure out how to convey to voters that Bernie Sanders was more electable than Hillary Clinton. As early as 2015, public polling consistently showed that Bernie Sanders was a stronger candidate against Trump and most of the other Republicans than Hillary Clinton would be. The media minimized and dismissed these polls as soon as they reported them. No, that's absolutely true. And, you know, I think uh, today is different than it was. You know, we're in a different position than we were uh, in 2015. I mean, Senator Sanders won 23 contests in the Democratic nominating process. And at that point, he had not won any. Uh, and, you know, there was uh, many people in the punditry, the Washington punditry, who thought he wasn't going to win anything. And that the gigantic crowds that we were seeing across the country with tens of thousands of people in attendance uh, would dissipate and disappear by the time people actually had to vote. Well, you know, as we know now, that did not happen. Uh, and, you know, I, I think it is uh, clear to a lot of people in hindsight, including a lot of rank and file Democrats, a lot of electeds, uh, that in fact the polling was correct and that Bernie Sanders would have been uh, more electable uh, in November of 2016. And in fact, uh, uh, just a few months ago, one of Trump's leading pollsters said, you know, if we had run against Sanders, we would have lost. So, you know, obviously there's still a difference of opinion about that. It's a little bit of an alternate universe uh, type of scenario. What if Bernie had uh, actually captured the nomination? Uh, but I I'm pretty convinced that he would have been a much more uh, uh, electable candidate for, for just a couple of reasons. One is, he, ha he did much better with independence throughout the process. And as you know, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are both minority parties in this country. Neither one has 50% of the voters. And so you have to be able to attract independent voters. And his appeal to independent voters, as we saw demonstrated in the Democratic primaries, was overwhelming. We were winning independent voters against Secretary Clinton by four to one uh, in most cases. So he had appeal with independent voters. And he also brought in a lot of young people of all, you know, the polling and all the research since the election shows that Bernie Sanders won millennials of uh, all races uh, throughout the process. So he excited a lot of young people. A lot of young people would have, you know, participated in the process who might otherwise have sat out. Will he run in 2020? Well, he's thinking about it. I know you have to ask the question. Uh, he is thinking about it, and uh, you know, I'm sh the appropriate time, I'm sure he will uh, give you a give you a response. Last time I was on this show, I created quite a stir you did. with with that <laughs> comment, but. Uh, uh, it, you know, it is something that he is looking at. Uh, you know, his his uh, consideration. He, you know, he really wants to be confident uh, that he is the best person to beat Donald Trump uh, because you know Trump is doing so much destruction to this country that we need to have a nominee who is the person best positioned to beat Donald Trump in 2020. If not him, who? Well, uh, you know, that's a process that will take place in the Democratic primary process, right? Uh, you know, as apropos of the discussion of superdelegates, it has always been my view: if you want to know who is the most electable person. Ask the voters, right? Not party insiders. 
uh, and you know, on some level, I don't know if I'm a party insider, but I'm certainly a uh, somebody involved in politics. So, uh, you know, I would say ask the voters, and we will find out through the Democratic primary process, which will now be a more open, transparent, and grassroots-run process. What is your role with Bernie Sanders right now, um, and um, how often are you speaking and talking about potentially running in 2020? Well, I talk to him about every day. Uh, certainly, it's not about running for president every day, I can tell you <laughs> that. Uh, you know, he's been very busy running around the country supporting Democrats uh, who are running for office, progressive Democrats. Just a tremendous victory in Florida with the uh, election or the nomination of uh, Andrew Gillum to be the next governor of Florida. Uh, an inspiring candidate who I think uh, can win that state. Uh, he can put together the coalition that's necessary to win. And, you know, on that same day, that, you know, three other down ballot candidates that the senator endorsed uh, won their primaries as well. So it was four for four that day. And, uh, you know, Ben Jealous in Maryland, right across the river here, is, uh, was a major surrogate in our campaign. And Bernie has campaigned quite hard for him, Stacey Abrams, uh, and folks all across the country. So, you know, I help with that work, certainly, um, and, you know, other initiatives that he has going on. Yeah, and out of Florida, the headline in the Wall Street Journal, Florida highlights parties' stark divides. Florida's race for the governor will offer the first major test of the Democratic and Republican Party bases, both of which are being transformed in the Trump era. Do you agree with that? Oh, I absolutely do. Look, I, I, you know, Andrew Gillum ran an unabashedly a progressive campaign. You know, he excited young people. Uh, he, he, the African American community, uh, very excited about the prospects of the first African American governor, which you know would be historic. Uh, and and he, look, he is talking about the issues that resonate with people of all races, right? You know, if you look at his background, he was the only non-millionaire in the race. You know, he comes from uh, humble origins. He worked his way up. He was elected to the Tallahassee City Council as a very young man. Uh, he, he's a super young candidate, but he's has 15 years of experience, including mayor of Tallahassee. So I think it shows you the type of confidence that the voters have had in him, and and uh, they understand what a special, you know, I'm in politics a lot. I meet a lot of politicians, and uh, uh, you know, sometimes you meet people who are really special. And you know, when I think of uh, Andrew Gillum, he's certainly one of those. Ben Jealous, Stacey Abrams, uh, people, you know. You get people who have that sort of spark, you know, and he's one of those people. Well, let's turn to our viewers. It's your turn now to uh, call in with your questions, your comments for Jeff Weaver about the future of the Democratic Party. We'll start with Mike, who's in Oklahoma City, Democrat. Good morning, Mike. Uh, morning, guys. And uh, Jeff, you're, you're a treasure to the country, uh, just like Bernie Sanders is. I think we've reached a point where even some Bernie Sanders voters crossed over and voted for Trump because his campaign rhetoric was that he was going to remove the influence of Wall Street and therefore helping the country work for the people, not just businesses. Now, we all know that despite the GOP voters not knowing this, that's pretty much all the Republican Party works for. 110 percent of the time is for the business interests. Uh, and that's why I think we have two jobs right now. One is to remove all these trickle-down economic big tax cuts for the 1% people out of state and federal government. So we've got to vote in November and remove GOP uh, office holders. Our next job is to elect progressives and slowly make the DNC, Tom Perez, realize that at some point they're going to have to let go of the Wall Street pit and let the people have a say in how that party functions. We can't get fast climate change. We can't get Medicare for all. We can't get what the earth and the people need until we put someone like Bernie Sanders truly free of Wall Street money in that office. Okay, and Mike, let's, your, sir. Okay, let's well, take that point. Thank you, and I, I'm uh, humbled by your comments. I'm not, certainly not uh, deserved on my part. But I, I, I would say this, uh, you know, the Democratic Party, and I discussed this in the book, frankly, that, that, you know, there was a schizophrenia in the Democratic Party in the 1990s driven by uh, Bill Clinton's neoliberal policies, which uh, really were harmful to many working class uh, Americans. And uh, it, it is certainly true that uh, the Democratic Party needs to get back to its modern roots in the sort of Roosevelt uh, uh, mold so that it can rebuild faith with working class people. Uh, all across this country in every zip code. Uh, but the party is moving in that direction. It's being driven by the grassroots. Uh, and again, I do want to, you know, Tom Perez and I don't agree on everything, but I, I, I do want to compliment him on his uh, leadership on helping to reform the 
uh, process. Uh, you know, apropos of the, the callers, other comments about the Republican Party. Look, you know, Trump sold working class people in this country a bill of goods. He said he would stand with working class people. He would drain the swamp. His administration is the most swamp infested uh, in the history of the country. Uh, he has at every opportunity with his economic policies stabbed working people in the back. How? Uh, well, we passed a tax bill on, on the Capitol Hill, which gave a tremendous amount of money, you know, billions and billions and billions, trillions to his wealthy uh, friends. Uh, and is that, that is going to now be used to starve Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, funding for uh, uh, local services around this country. Um, you know, he has done nothing to address wages. Unemployment is, as you know, gone down substantially. Uh, but if you look at all the evidence, and I'm sure it's, it was in the newspapers, I believe, yesterday, the day before, you know, wages for the average person have not gone up. He tried to take health care away from tens of millions of people uh, by uh, repealing the Affordable Care Act with absolutely no plan to do something uh, in the alternative. So he has gone after the economic interests of working people, the people who were his base in many places, uh, who he, again, sold a bill of goods to and then got in here. You know, Wall Street runs his administration, the economic policies of his administration. That's pretty clear. Uh, you know, he has uh, rightly understood that there were problems with our trade policy, but instead of going in there in a, in a way that was going to improve the situation, went in there with a hand grenade uh, and has caused a great lot of harm in rural America in terms of agricultural prices. Uh, so there was, you know, there's, there's, it's one thing to identify a problem and another to have the competence uh, and the good intentions to go in there and handle a problem in the right way, and he has not done that. If the president announces a deal, which potentially could come as early as tomorrow, to um, a new NAFTA deal between the Canada, the United States, and Mexico, do you have concerns that that hurts Democrats' chances in the midterm election? In the midterm elections? Well, I try not to. You know, that's not the lens I look through. The question is: Is is the policy going to help working people in this country who have been struggling, right? And who many families work full time and have trouble keeping their head above water? They worry about how they're going to send their kids to college, how they're going to afford medicine for themselves and their kids, how they're going to take care of their aging parents and the high cost of, of doing that. So these are the that's the lens through which I look at things, not like the like who's who's benefiting, who's not benefiting. But the truth is, is that this administration as a whole has really done bad things to working people. Uh, and one of the things they've done is trying to divide working people up because that's one of the ways that you maintain corporate power. Is you divide working people up, you divide them by race, you divide them by gender, you divide them by sexual orientation, uh, and that uh, prevents working people from working together to further their interests. We'll hear from Bill next, who's in Canton, Illinois, sure. independent. Uh, good morning, C-SPAN. Good morning, Mr. Weaver. Weaver. Uh, I'm one of 25 strong Democrats from Illinois who voted for Trump. <clears throat> and the reason being we will vote for Republicans this time and for the next president is because of two major reasons. Number one, is the, the stance of the Democratic Party with the, regards to the illegal immigrants and sanctuary cities. And number two is universal health care. Universal health care of any type will not work in the United States because of until the government steps in and regulates hospitals, doctors, and clinics. Now, you can make the point that Medicare works, yes, but the government regulates the cost. The VA works, yes, but the government regulates the cost. And the lobbyists are so great in the hospitals, clinics, and doctors, they will never work. And that's why we broke away from the Democratic Party, and we are going to vote Republican until the Democratic Party quits this stance on illegal immigration, open borders, and wants universal health care for everyone. Because every working American will pay for that. And the middle class was giving, given nothing by the last eight years of the administration and the Democratic Party. Bill, can nothing. I ask you this question? Do you think the Republicans, are you saying the Republicans are more likely to regulate industry, hospitals, doctors, than Democrats? The, no party will be able to until they get the lobbyists out of there. And the lobbyists have dug in so deep, there's no way that the hospitals and doctors and clinics will ever let the government regulate them. Okay, heard your point. Jeff Weaver. Well, I, look, I'm not gonna disagree that uh, lobbyists have inordinate amount of influence in Washington, D.C. That I mean, that's just a fact, certainly. Uh, but I think what the caller uh, you know, should understand is that every other major industrialized Western country has some form of national uh, health care program, which guarantees health care to all of their people. They deliver health care at half the cost per capita that we do. 
Uh, and I always find it amazing that people who, you know, Republicans often talk about America's exceptionalism, but somehow other countries can do things we can't. And uh, I, I actually uh, believe, you know, quite the opposite, that, you know, it is a problem with lobbyists. The insurance company lobbyists are some, the pharmaceutical lobbyists uh, who work for an industry that charges us the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. You know, you can go across the border to Canada in many cases buy medication, same medication, same package, same factory, same, basically same regulatory process for a fraction of the price you buy it for here. Look, American people is being ripped off. A national health care system, a Medicare for all system would uh, help squeeze out the, uh, the uh, waste and abuse and, and fraud, frankly, it happens uh, in the current system. And all of this administrative paperwork and bureaucracy that people don't understand that they're paying for uh, as part of their health care bill. So, you know, every other country, as I said, it, it, you know, Western industrialized country does it this way. We're out of sync with that. Uh, that benefits the pharmaceutical industry and a lot of other uh, people in corporate America. Uh, we've got to join the others and make ourselves, look, it'll make us more competitive economically as well. You know, you talk to business leaders uh, who are in manufacturing and they talk about the outrageous amount of money they're paying for their health insurance for their uh, people. So uh, we've got to join the rest of the industrialized world uh, and do that. On the issue of immigration, you know, look, this is a flashpoint. The truth of the matter is, is that uh, uh, undocumented people in this country are not taking jobs away from Americans. It's just not, it's just not factually true, right? Um, uh, the, you know, many industries in this country do rely on undocumented labor. Certainly agriculture does uh, to a large extent. Uh, you know, if you, you know, really lock down the border completely, I don't know, what, I don't know that there'd be an agricultural sector in California, frankly, for instance, or in Florida. Um, but what we have got to do is bring people out of the shadows, right? People are living in fear, families are being torn apart. Uh, taken to its extreme, you see this uh, really cruel uh, Trump policy of ripping, uh, you know, toddlers away from their mothers, uh, some of whom may never get reunited with their families, uh, others who have, we have found out now have been sexually abused. Um, so we have got to deal with immigration in a rational way. There is no open, open borders policy, um, but we have got to bring our neighbors out of the shadows and to have a rational immigration policy uh, in this country. We'll, we'll go to David, who's here in Washington, D.C., on our line for Democrats. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Um, the reason I'm calling is because every time I hear Bernie's name, I get sparks something in me. And, and the reason why know. is because <laughs> in the in the district uh, in Washington, I was a burn. I was like they say, still the burn. And, and um, but most people I talk to, they just for some odd reason couldn't couldn't get on the Bernie campaign. I mean the Bernie wagon. And, and um, why why not, David? What did they tell you? Why they couldn't do it? Well, what it was, everybody seemed to be stuck on Clinton, you know, and and, and to me, I'm not going to, I hate to use the term, stuck on stupid, you know, but but, but I, I voted for Hillary, I mean, in the election, but in the, in the uh, primaries, I definitely voted for Bernie, but he, he had lost, so I had a choice between uh, Bernie and Trump. Like, the guy just said he, he voted for Trump, and he's going to be a Trump and Republican, but no, I... I I hesitantly uh, uh, voted for Hillary, though. But I, I, I really, I really think that that, and like they say, feel the burn. Bernie Sanders got burned by the Democratic Party, and, and uh, I think it was a setup from the beginning. And, okay, well, let, just, let's leave it there. Jeff Weaver, was it a setup from the beginning? Well, look, I mean, the evidence is pretty clear at this point that, you know, people within the Democratic Party, in particular the chair at the time, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, uh, certainly had her finger on the scale uh, in favor of Secretary Clinton. That's just the case. And again, you know, this is a little bit like the Bernie versus Bernie had won. Would he have beaten Trump? I think yes. You know, if, if all of these impediments had been removed, would Bernie have won the nomination? I, I, that's a question we will never know the answer to. But, you know, that is why we had this Unity Reform Commission, to try to clean up these types of problems so that this does not happen in the future because whoever the nominee is you know he or she should not have their nomination tainted by the thought that somehow the process was not fair and that they're not a legitimate nominee right so um, doing that benefits frankly the party and everybody else uh, Cornelia in Cottonwood uh, Idaho Republican hi well <clears throat> I was just gonna say I hope the American people are smart enough not to vote along any party lines, really. But look at the individual themselves that is running for office and uh, try to figure things out according to the qualities of the candidate, not the party that they represent. In fact, Mr. Bernie Sanders, doesn't he claim to be an independent, and yet he uses the Democratic Party to uh, run? Let's take that point. You know, Jeff Weaver. 
Sure. So Bernie Sanders has always run as an independent in Vermont. That is certainly true. He, he did run uh, in the Democratic nominating process for president. Uh, you know, he is part of the Senate Democratic leadership. Uh, he is an active participant in the Vermont coordinated campaign. In fact, he's the major funder this time. You know, he uh, has given them over $150,000 uh, to help elect Democrats in Vermont. He has raised the 2016 election cycle. He raised five, over $5 million for down ballot Democrats. I think we're probably closing on $2 million so far in this election cycle. Uh, so, you know, in some ways, in the, in the legal business, is a term sui generis, a thing unto itself. And in many ways, Bernie is a thing unto himself. You know, he is, uh, in, in fact, the Vermont Democratic Party uh, has passed a resolution declaring him a Democrat in Vermont. So, uh, uh, of all the people down here in Washington, he may be the only person who has been explicitly declared a Democrat by their state Democratic Party. Diana in Galesburg, Illinois, Democrat. Uh, yes, uh, I enjoy C-SPAN and just wanted to let you know that I really like your programming. Um, my question is, why did Bernie vote against sanctions on Russia? He voted uh, with Rand, Paul, and they were the only two votes. Sure. Well, I can't speak about uh, why Rand Paul voted the way he did, but I can. let's talk a little bit about the uh, sanctions bill. So uh, there were two parts of that bill. One uh, was sanctions on Russia, and the other part of the bill was to impose sanctions on Iran, but essentially undoing uh, the uh, key uh, foreign policy accomplishment of the Obama administration, which was the, the, the deal with uh, Iran. So there were a, a number of votes. The final vote had both of those together. There were a number of votes along the way, which were just Russia sanctions, which Senator Sanders voted for. Uh, he did not. In fact, he he's the only person on the Democratic side on the Hill who stood uh, in support of uh, preventing the Republicans from undoing the Iran nuclear deal, uh, which again was the you know the key uh, foreign policy achievement of the Obama administration. So that's why he voted against the entire package. He did support the Russia sanctions. He did not support undoing uh, the Iran nuclear deal. Matt Jacksonville, Florida, Republican. Hi, Matt. Hi. Uh, I just had a quick question for you, Jeff. Sure. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, I mean, you know, like I said, I am a Republican, but I do believe, though, in uh, universal health care. Uh, my wife's English, and uh, she was actually employed as a nurse by the NHS. And I was just wondering, why do we not hear about education reform that is going to have to come with the universal health care? Well, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Senator Sanders has talked about uh, is greatly increasing federal support to create more doctors and nurses in this country. Obviously, if we're going to have a universal health care system, obviously there are you know many communities in this country which are underserved in terms of medical providers. So we do need to have, uh, in conjunction with the universal health care program, uh, a system of training medical professionals that ensures that not only do we have enough, but that they are in the right places. Paul, Fall River, Massachusetts, Democrat. Yes, hello. Good Thank morning. For, good morning. Thanks for C-SPAN. Yeah, I just want to say hello to Jeff and um, thank him for the job he did with Bernie Sanders' campaign. I'm a Bernie su supporter. I'm an old Democrat veteran, and I think we really got to stand up to Trump. Paul, do you want to see him run in 2020? Yes. Okay. Yes, I do. I'd like to see Bernie run. I think I think he could help us a lot. I think he, he cares about the veteran. He really cares about people. He's not a fake. And he would he would probably help straighten out the country what we need now. We don't need a president that goes around saying there's fake news and fake this and anything. Trump only likes the veterans that like him. He doesn't like all of us. And I was at the VA yesterday and I mean doctors, nurses they all feel the same way. Trump's not the best thing for us. Okay, Paul, I'm going to leave it there. Jeff Weaver, let me ask you this. Sure. Based off of what uh, that caller just said and the other caller who asked uh, or who made the statement that um, Senator Sanders used the Democratic Party, the platform, to run for president, why not change from an independent to a Democrat then? Look, he's always run that way. He, you know, he will be running the Democratic Party in Vermont will now endorse him uh, as it has in every other uh, one of his uh, Senate elections. It, you know, he has uh, an independent democratic relationship uh, with the party. You know, he has obviously been critical of the direction of the party in the 1990s, a sort of neoliberal swing of the party, because, you know, he understands that you cannot send a mixed message to working class voters. They want to know that you are on their side. And when you send them a mixed message, uh, it creates a lot of confusion and creates division between uh, the party uh, and the, the, the working class base of the party. And that's a problem. Uh, and he has always stood with working people. Again, you know, I like to say Bernie's sui generis. He's a thing unto himself. But, you know, he, he is in Democratic leadership. 
supports Democratic candidates. He has certainly done more. I mean, he raised more money for down ballot Democratic candidates in the 2016 election cycle than anybody else. Anybody. I'm not going to name names, but anybody else. Where is he in 2018 for raising money? Uh, I think we're closing in on $2 million for down ballot candidates. And by the time this is all over, it will probably be in excess of that, certainly. Headline in the Washington Post In Arizona, Florida, outside groups help non white Democrats win. Both candidates in Arizona. Um, and in other places, support statewide universal health care. Both want U.S. immigration and customs enforcement to be replaced, and both call for a ban on assault weapons. Neither seemed destined for a victory without outside help. Right. Well, look, the reality of, of modern politics, I, I can tell you as somebody who practices in American politics, uh, every candidate has, quote unquote, outside help. Uh, you know, the establishment candidates get tons of money from the sort of traditional Democratic donor class. On the Republican side, you know, the corporate money, the Koch brother money, you know, flows in. Uh, and, you know, what, one of the things that is exciting about uh, what has happened since 2016 is just, there have always been, you know, progressive grassroots groups, but there's a new energy at the, at the grassroots. Uh, and the amount of help that people can provide and technology is assisted with this too. You know, people can do calls for candidates in other states, right? You know, because now you have a computer in your house and like the numbers come up and you can make calls for people. You know, people are increasingly traveling to other states to work in campaigns. I, you know, I was just on a Facebook thread with folks who were headed down to Florida to help Andrew Gillum. Um, and so, yeah, people are, you know, the grassroots of this country wants to take this country back from, from Trump and his, uh, you know, corporate masters. Um, that, you know, they want to transform the Democratic Party so that it truly represents working people and marginalized communities. And they're taking action, and that's an exciting thing. We'll go to Melvin, who's in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, Democrat. Hi, good morning, folks. I got a few quick comments. Well, first of all, it's amazing how the, Dem the Republicans just folded so easy and just let Trump just walk all over them. Uh, they forget all about their core values. The second thing is, I think the future for our party is we got to quit beating each other up. By the time Bernie and Hillary got through with each other, they really didn't have, I mean, Trump didn't have nothing else to worry about, although we won by a few million votes, but they destroyed each other. So my thing is, we need to select some, some one person that we want and just go at that. Because when you don't beat each other up all day long, there's nothing left, in my opinion. Okay, Jeff Weaver. Yeah, I, I, yeah look, I, I, the, in historical terms, the 2016 primary process on the Democratic side was very tame. In fact, the 2007 2008 race between Secretary Clinton and, and uh, President Obama was much more contentious and much more acrimonious. Uh, and many more of Secretary Clinton's uh, supporters in that race ended up supporting John McCain than was the case in 2016 with Bernie supporters and Trump. I mean, that's just. The research is pretty clear on that. Yeah, I, so I, I get what the, the what the caller is saying, and, and obviously there's a, an issue of conserving resources on the Democratic side, which are expended in a primary process. On the other hand, I really am a firm believer that the base of the Democratic Party should choose the candidate, because there are differences within the party. We have two major parties in this country, and so they are both necessarily coalitions, right? Unlike in Europe and other places where you have a lot of smaller parties, which are much more ideologically homogenous, the Democratic Party is a big tent party. Republican Party is a big but sort of narrower tent party these days. Um, so the primary process is a very important uh, way for the rank and file of the party to signal to party leaders and to elected officials about where the rank and file of the party wants to see the party going. And I, I, it would be bad to lose that. And you know, but the, the, you know, you've got to have vigorous policy debates. But you, you know, it should not be personal. It should not be overly negative. And I, I have to say, I, you know, although at times in the middle of the process, I, you know. Everybody gets heated and upset. Uh, you know, I think by and large, uh, both the Clinton people and our campaign handled the least the public presentation of their candidates in a civil way. We'll go to Naples, Florida, and Walter is an independent there. Walter, your turn. Question or comment here for Jeff Weaver. Good morning, Mr. Weaver. I was just considering, would like you to consider um, the ages of the um, different groups that seems to me that the uh, Democrats are much younger than the younger people that are turning voting age are not being inspired by our current leadership. And then the candidates themselves, I think Mr. Trump's about 72 and not sure how old Bernie is, but where will they be with the trends that are going? Where is this going to be in two to six years when, when Trump's no longer in office and Bernie's probably not, you know, they'll be elder statesmen. 
if that's possible in some cases. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, it is true that uh, the younger people are moving uh, increasingly toward the Democratic Party in terms of their voting. But, you know, the truth is, is that younger people overwhelmingly, when they register to vote, are registering as independents. Uh, even though they'll vote Democratic, they'll work for Democratic candidates. You know, the new generation in America has a different relationship with institutions. It's not just political parties. It's religion. It's the workplace. So, you know, the society is changing. And, you know, when we talk about open primaries versus closed primaries, you know, these closed primaries are keeping all of those young people out. That's not a good thing for the future. You know, the party has to adapt to the way young people interact with institutions in general. Uh, and so, you know, in terms of new leadership, it, you know, we just talked about a number of candidates running for governors, a lot of candidates running for con Congress who are younger candidates who are espousing an unabashedly progressive position. I'm very hopeful for the future. You have a, you have a uh, progressive, you know, young voting base, right, very progressive leaning. You have young progressive candidates. You have some older candidates uh, like Bernie who are, you know, espousing progressive ideas. Um, and I, I, you know, I think it bodes well for the progressive movement in this country. We'll go to Laurel, Mississippi. Jeff, a Republican, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm making a comment about uh, the socialist Democrat Mr. Gillum, when uh, the sound said something about the monkey ranch, he meant a monkey ranch, is like, which is a pipe ranch. The whole thing in the south and New York and places, uh, someone throwed a monkey ranch into the gear works, fouled the whole system up. That's what the man meant. He didn't mean anything racist by it. And most people in the south understand this. And also, Mr. Sanders, why did he make case, I think his honeymoon in, in Russia? And also, why does he try to take other people's money? Because to run a socialist party, because sooner or later you run out of other people's money. They only do to raise taxes. Nobody wins. Thank you. And Jeff uh, was talking about uh, Ron DeSantis, who, run, who, who won the Republican primary for governor in Florida, drew major criticism, this is from the Washington Times, on Wednesday when he made a remark about voters picking Democratic opponent Tallahassee Mayor Andrew Gillum instead of him. Mr. Gillum avoided polarizing language after his victory speech, it says, in the Washington Times, referring to um, Mr. DeSantis saying, let's not monkey this up. Right. Look, I I mean, from my perspective, it was not, uh, a, a, you know, a dog whistle. It was, you know, a full shout out from the roof of uh, of his campaign headquarters. And it's, you know, it's telling that he uh, has not personally addressed this uh, by apologizing. Um, you know, it, it's a clear uh, attempt to to try to inject race into the the race. Uh, and you know, I, and I think voters in Florida look. You've, there's a lot of reasons to support Andrew Gillum, but. You know, do you really want to elect a Republican governor like this? I mean, what is this going to do for tourism in a state uh, that is so dependent on tourism when you you have a, somebody who wants to be the chief executive who's going to inject this kind of racial animus and this kind of hatred uh, into uh, the, the political campaign? So, you know, voters down there have a really tough decision to make coming up. I mean, I don't think it's tough, but I mean, they've got two candidates. It's a very important decision, I should say. I guess that's what I should say. Um, but look, he comes out of the gate and he makes these kind of racist comments. Um, I know there are a bunch of expressions with monkeys, monkey around, monkey wrench. That's not what he said, right? This is not, the expression he used is not an expression that anybody uses. Uh, he's a Harvard trained lawyer. I mean, come on. That's a place where you learn how to use words uh, and to uh, use those words to persuade people to your point of view. And I think everybody knows what he was doing. Let's go to Joan, who's in Minnesota, Democrat. Joan, good morning. You're our last call here, here for Jeff Weaver. Go ahead. Okay. Um, in uh, when George Bush was president, and I think it was 2006, I'm not sure of the year, but the Democrats tried to pass a bill stopping all migrant workers coming from like Mexico to uh, work in the United States. The bill didn't pass. One Democrat, Ted Kennedy, voted against it, and all of the Republicans voted against it at the time, um, and they were in control of the House. Most illegals come here for the jobs. The corp corporations want the illegals here to work for them. They work cheaper, and they don't complain about the job. And they never leave. They bring their families, and they stay here. This, this is, they become the real illegals in this country. So it's not the Democrats that want the, the illegals here. It's the Republicans for the corporations. Okay, okay Joan, I'm going to take that point. Mr. Weaver. Look, you know, corporations obviously uh, try to find the cheapest labor they can. That's, uh, you know, clear in the way that they export our jobs to low-wage countries. But I would, say, I would say this. Look, people who are immigrating to the United States 
are coming here for the same reason that all of our families immigrated to the United States, because they're looking for a better life for them and their families. In many cases, they are escaping uh, uh, religious persecution or political persecution or wars. Uh, so there's nothing really different today than there, there was in the whole history of our country. You know, I grew up on the northern border in Vermont, uh, on the Canadian border, and when I was growing up, frankly, that border was, I mean, we talk about open border, people waved through the border crossings, roads that crisscross across the border and tell you to report to the nearest custom station. You know, this is just a feature of growing up uh, where I was in a border community, and the on the northern side, right? So, uh, you know, things are really not all that different. You know, the truth is, though, that you, know, you get people like Trump, but what they do is they try to inflame a racial animus. It is always the other, right? You only succeed uh, in uh, helping the corporate class, the billionaire class, when you can divide people up in the 99% of the rest of us. And that's what they're doing. They want to separate brown from black, from white, from men, from women, from gay, from straight. Like, this is such, it's so out of the classic playbook, right? And, um, you know, in many ways, though, you know, what we're seeing in this country is what the Western democracies in Europe faced in the beginning of the 20th century. And, you know, if Trump gets reelected, we're really at a tipping point in this country and whether we're going to tip toward an authoritarian kind of government. I mean, you saw the preview of it with the children being ripped from their mother's arms, a policy which they had to retreat from because, in fact, Republican, Republicans in the heartland were saying this is outrageous, this cannot happen. Like, you, no one in America gets their children ripped away from them for committing a misdemeanor. Like, should you jaywalk and have your children taken away from you? I mean, it's... It, it was so outrageous, but this is this is where we're headed with people like Trump, uh, and it is up, up for all people, including Republicans, independents, and Democrats, to stand up against what Trump is doing. I get that some people are quote unquote conservative. It's always been conservatives in this country, and we've had conservative leaders. John McCain was a conservative leader, a great American hero, right? So there's nothing wrong with being a conservative, but what is going on in the White House right now is really a very very un-American occurrence. And again, this is something that our European allies confronted at the beginning of the 20th century. Many of what we call the greatest generation lost their lives fighting it abroad, uh, and we've got to fight it at home. Jeff Weaver, author and former Bernie Sanders presidential campaign manager, thank you thank for the you. time. We are going to take a quick break. When we come back, we will open up the phone lines. You can respond to anything you've heard from Mr. Weaver this morning or Frank Buckley before that. Any politics policy issue is on the table. There are the phone lines on your screen. We'll be back right after we show you from this week's Newsmakers program.